Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here to see all these people interested in machine learning. So um, thank you, Marcel, for the embarrassing introduction. You know, so you think I'm a paper pusher, which I am. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I have one, one, you know, just one little uh, contribution here to this topic. I did actually my master's thesis with the co-inventor of least mean squares, LMS, Bernie Widrow. So at some point, I was doing the right thing. <laughs> you know, I took a wrong turn, I guess. Um, OK, so I'm going to tell you um, about a little bit what we do here at EPFL from the point of view of the, you know, the, the central management, as we can call it. But it's mostly about trust, and it's about trust in science and trust in education and also about how we think about education in the digital age. And Marcel will again show up. OK, sorry. <laughs> you will also be part of the talk. OK, so research in the digital age. So one thing that uh, out-of-towners might not know is that Switzerland has been a contributor uh, to artificial intelligence and robotics for a very long time. OK, so this is a, a humanoid robot. Uh, I think this is a writer. It was invented, constructed, I should say, in the late 18th century, before the French Revolution, uh, 1782 or something. So a watchmaker in the mountains here in the Jura constructed humanoid robots which were programmable. OK, so this writer, you can put punch cards, and the writer will write various letters uh, completely automatically. There is a musician and, and, uh, and somebody drawing a nice little pictures. And uh, this was, from an engineering point of view, was an incredible feat, because this is extremely complicated. And remember, that's 18th century technology. OK? And um, that's a good start. Now, I'm glad that we are back in the game with the applied machine learning days here. OK. In the meantime, a lot of things changed, of course. And uh, data science is mostly, uh, a, I would say, an Anglo-Saxon uh, game. You probably know that uh, from an economy that was oil-based in the beginning of the 21st century, it's now essentially an economy that is data-based. So if you look at the most valued companies, and that's from a cover of The Economist, the most valued companies in the world change totally from the Exxons of this world to the GAFAs of this world. And you know that's good for us, because we are interested in the topic. It's also, speaking of bias, it's a very Anglo-Saxon bias, actually, on the topic, if I may say so. And I've lived long enough in the United States you know, to say it with a certain uh, experience. All right. Now, my point of view is a different one. So if you think about the big changes in science, how science was done, then you know it's always a mix of new technologies or methods, new ideas, and uh, the interplay of the two. And very clearly, the invention of optics, the understanding of optics uh, by Sir Isaac Newton uh, about 350 years ago, so the fundamental insight into how optics actually works which was, you know, of course, derived over centuries, but was really written down very explicitly by Newton in the book called Optics. Uh, this new theory led to the invention of microscopes, and microscopes allowed to do, uh, you know, cellular biology, for example, because you actually could actually observe the processes. But it also invented, of course, telescopes. With this, you could do uh, astronomy, for example. And so my point is that maybe we are at the cusp. If we really understand data science, because I'm not sure we fully understand it, right? There is this question of understandable AI. Do we actually, <laughs> are we able to understand what's inside the black box? If we really understand this, then we will have a new instrument, which I call a data scope. And the data scope is exactly like optics deriving microscopes and telescopes. It's, you know, not a black box. It's a set of theoretical and algorithmic tools which allows them to go hunt for knowledge in many, many different fields of application. I think that's what's really uh, exciting about data science today. All right. So at uh, EPFL, or in Switzerland, I should say, we launched about a year ago the Swiss Data Science Center together with our sister school in Zurich, ETH. And uh, the original goal of the Swiss Data Science Center was actually to help 
different sciences that are data heavy, but not necessarily versed into data science algorithmics to make the best out of the data. And interestingly enough, when it was started very quickly, people from sciences we would not necessarily expect, like environmental sciences, would come with loads of data to the Swiss Data Science Center and say, okay, can you help us actually derive new knowledge from the data sets we have? This, I find an example of this data scope idea, okay, that specialists from machine learning, from computer science, from statistics, help other sciences derive new theories, new models based on the data that they have. All right. Now, there is a question with not just with data science, but with all of ICT, and I very much enjoyed, of course, the talk about ethics and AI, is there are the questions of privacy, there are the questions of cybersecurity, there is a question of, you know, how do you deal with this dematerialized world where you don't know who the counterpart is because you will never meet the person. Uh, you, the counterpart might actually be a robot or an algorithm and not a real person. Uh, the question of can you actually really make advances in personalized health without violating the privacy of patients. All these questions create a whole slew of new, very interesting, but also very important societal issues. And so at EBFL, we decided to launch a center for digital trust because we think the notion of trust is the one that is really fundamental to the organization of societies. That's also the difference between apes and uh, humans, is that we manage to create webs of trust which allow us to essentially interact with billions of people. And in the digital age, we have to reinvent this notion of trust. And uh, a group of EPFL professors, you see many of them here on this slide, banded together to address many facets of this fundamental issue of what does it mean to develop trust in the digital age. All right, so that was a little bit about research, the Swiss Data Science Center, the Center for Digital Trust, uh, connected to issues of data science and machine learning. Let me talk a little bit about education. If you are in this room, you know that digital skills are survival skills, so you'll be, not be surprised by the New Yorker cartoon. I'm afraid that I have to inform you that the kidney went to a patient who can code, okay, much more valuable to societies than the poor guy here. Um, I don't have to persuade you, but uh, this is, of course, a debate in Switzerland about coding skills, coding in schools, and so on. I'll come back to this because I have a very pointed opinion on this. Um, but before this, let me simply say that I told you about the humanoid robots in Switzerland. There is another tradition in Switzerland that I like. It's a notion of free education. So a visionary fellow in the 19th century called Pestalozzi uh, is the man who in Switzerland promoted free education for all, managed to transform the country from the beginning of the 19th century, where maybe there, is, there was a, a rate uh, of 25% that knew how to read and write, to by the end of the 19th century, to about 75 or 80 percent, which transformed Switzerland fundamentally from an agrarian society in a society that could actually deal with the first industrial revolution, so Pestalozzi. And so, of course, we couldn't refrain from evolving Pestalozzi into the digital age, that's 1990s, and uh, this is, we all know, from uh, the end of the 20th century. That's the beginning of the revolution we are seeing now. The true revolution is, of course, uh, is of course AI. And uh, we use this little picture from DeepArt. And I, I hear that one of the co-founders of DeepArt is actually in the room. So I'd like to thank him personally for <laughs> making this tool available for, uh, for us to use and make cute pictures. Of course, when I made the picture, somebody sent me an email and said, okay, so what style, you know, who is this? Who is the painter? You know, is this uh, Van Gogh? Is it, uh, I don't know what? The answer, well we'll, well, we'll ask the founder and inventor of this tool. Okay, so uh, the question is, we are in the 21st century. In the 19th century, Pestalozzi said, to survive in modern society, 19th century, you need to know how to read and write. 
What are the skills we need in the 21st century? What do we have to teach to our students here at EPFL, but not only the students? What do we have to teach to the general population to be able to deal with all the upheavals that come with the digital transformation of society, uh, with the dematerialization, with electronic voting, e uh, fake news, and so on and so on. And so let me focus first on EPFL. So EPFL is an institute of technology, so it's not a comprehensive university. It is one that is concentrated on natural sciences, engineering sciences, life sciences, plus architecture. Um, but we have a long tradition in computer science from the 80s, uh, introducing you know, new curricula around computer science, uh, also communication sciences. We were also very involved in trying to broaden the appeal of computer science, for example, to girls. We have a program started uh, 15 years ago, Internet pour les filles, quite popular. Uh, we went into digital humanities uh, quite heavily because we think it's an interesting, exciting frontier for computer scientists interacting with social sciences and humanities. Um, we were also forerunners in the excitement around massive open online courses, MOOCs. Uh, I think we are the first continental European university active there. We have close to 100 courses online, which are EPFL courses made available to the world, and uh, I think close to 2 million users. So it's one of the real MOOCs uh, uh, factory here at EPFL, and we're very committed to this. Uh, partly because we learn enormously by putting classes online. That's maybe a surprising detail, is that we do it, yes, for the good of the world, but also to learn how to improve our own classes. Okay, then 2016, I'll come back with the slides, the Extension School, the Swiss Data Science Center, and starting last fall, a new master in data science, quite popular. Uh, like many other schools, of course, we went into this field. Let me remind you that data science is not a new field. Uh, there is a famous paper by David Donohoe, who is a statistician, but also a data science guy um, who wrote 50 years of data science. Actually, it's after 50 years of Turkey, who was a professor at Princeton, sort of saying what data science was, and he was a statistician by training. Uh, I think it's a very natural evolution of statistics combined with computer science, with mathematics, and domain knowledge, and that's what makes this field extremely exciting today. Okay, so the one change we do here at EPFL, uh, which I think is quite fundamental, is I remind you, we are an institute of technology, so the students here got, uh, get selected, I must be very honest, and exams are going on as we speak, I think. Uh, in first year, essentially, the two pillars of education at EPFL are mathematics and physics. Mathematics, it's a discipline of clear thinking, of posing problems very, and then thinking about them uh, very rigorously. Physics is about approximation, approxim modeling the real world by models on which you can reason and you can compute things. And these are really the pillars you know, of education in hard sciences, in engineering sciences, all the world over. But what we noticed is that um, any field of hard science, life science, and engineering, once the people actually solve problems, they don't sit down, most of them, okay, except the logicians and the topologists, uh, mostly don't sit down with a piece of paper and a, a pen, they sit down with a computer and use computational methods to answer questions. And we notice that we did sort of teach this along the way, okay, en passant, but we didn't uh, recognize it as one of the pillars of the education. And we call this computational thinking. So computational thinking is not programming. I want to be very clear about this one because I'm asked a question all the time. You know, they say, oh, you introduce computational thinking. So what language, right? You know, C++, Python, whatever. And my answer is that, you know, when you teach philosophy, the first question you ask is not, should be taught in German or in French or in English. You say, you know, which branch of philosophy are we going to study? And so computational thinking is not about programming, it's not about the language. That's an afterthought. Computational thinking is about posing problems in such a way that you can find answers in a computational manner. 
And this is very important because I see a lot of people here on campus elsewhere, uh, let's say computational chemistry, and uh, they ask a question, but it is very important to know if there is an answer to the question. Okay, that's sort of useful. We heard about combinatorics. There might be actually no computable answer in any finite time because the thing is so complex. Then you need to know, can you approximate it? And if you approximate it, how close the approximation is from an ideal solution? Okay, and then you need to find an, uh, an algorithm that actually does it. Then you have to ultimately program or use, you know, a toolbox that allows you to find the answer. So this computational thinking is going to be introduced at EPFL in the fall of 2018, this fall, in a few months. So we are hard at work to introduce a third pillar in the education, which will be computational thinking. As you can see, I could go on forever on this, so let me <laughs> get to the next slide. Now, that one is uh, sort of more cultural. And uh, I mentioned, you know, the GAFAs and so on. And Europe, for uh, unfortunate reason, did not really embrace computer science for a very long time. The view of Europe, uh, actually the name itself uh, is, is, is sort of uh, uh, shows it all in French and in German. We don't have computer science. We have something called informatic in German or informatique. And uh, informatics is not computer science. It's the application of computers to something. So for a very long time, the view in Europe, uh, with a few exceptions, and I'm happy to say that uh, EPFL and ETH in Zurich are part of the exceptions, but overall in Europe, the attitude was that, oh, if we have a problem which requires you know, computers to solve, we buy a US computer, we buy a US software, and then the solution magically will appear. That's fine uh, if you're, uh, let's say, in the basement of a, you know, of a company, but if you want to really uh, push the envelope of know-how, this is not the method to do. And so here at EPFL, we're very engaged in fundamental computer science as well as applied computer science. And um, I think this is also important because computer science and its applications become more and more central in the human activities and the way society functions. And again, I come back to ethics. Uh, we are also looking into introducing ethics, actually, around questions like AI, autonomous weapons, robotics, and so on. All right. Okay, back to the star of the day. Marcel Salate came with a very original idea. Uh, what, a year ago or so, he said, okay, there is a digital tsunami coming, a transformation of society. Many people will be confused, would want to learn basic skills, don't know where to go to get basic skills. Okay, he jumped into it and very quickly launched the EPFL Extension School, which are, you know, uh, classes that are taught online, but where people help, you know, so you register, it's a finite number of people, it's not these huge, massive open online uh, classes, there is a restricted number, and there are teaching assistants that help people do real things, just like uh, I think you did over the weekend with the workshops here at Say Applied Machine Learning Days. This is a very interesting experiment, uh, so far it looks very exciting and very popular. And we are talking already about adding potentially more classes to the basic sets that has been developed over 2017. All right, I see the clock is running. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I find very intriguing is that if you look at how society functions, and uh, I really found very interesting in the previous talks, the discussion about regulation and putting architecture and uh, artificial intelligence as, you know, uh, one very mature field which has regulations and, uh, you know, checks and balances and so on, and AI, which is just a new kid on the block and is just exploring. So if you look at how the world is governed today, then <coughs> The classic governance goes back to the Greeks, to the Roman law, and so on, right? So, so we re regulate the airspace, we regulate uh, the land, we, we regulate the sea, and so on. But this new fifth dimension, uh, which is the cyberspace, actually has very few regulations. And I think this is for us, together with people from the social sciences and humanities, to give good guidance how this new fifth dimension should actually be regulated. Okay, 
And uh, one initiative which personally I find very interesting, which was discussed uh, last week uh, in a little mountain town, is the Digital Geneva Convention. So you probably know about the Geneva Convention that sort of regulate precisely uh, how to protect civilians in case of war, but also in general. And the Geneva Conventions, as the name indicates, were signed in Geneva after Second World War. And the International Red Cross is actually uh, the, the, how, actually the, the regulation body for the International Geneva Conventions. And an initiative by Brad Smith, who is the president of Microsoft, but it's really his initiative because he strongly believes in this, says, okay, with cyber attacks, you need to sort of add new elements to the Geneva Convention. He calls this the Digital Geneva Convention. I find this an interesting, ethically important issue, and uh, potentially Switzerland, as a neutral country, a little, very little country that has no real influence on the world, could actually take this as one of the initiatives to help regulate cyberspace. All right. There is one last uh, point I want to make, is that uh, in this dematerialized new economy, there are also some risks, and uh, the risks I usually explain with this little example, which I call the cuckoo economy. Okay, and the cuckoo economy is very simple. You know how the cuckoo puts an egg, you know, the, the, the odd egg out into the nest of somebody else, and then uh, the birds that have actually built the nest and have put the other eggs sort of take care of the cuckoo, uh, of the little cuckoo, until the cuckoo grows, puts the other eggs out of the nest, etc. So why am I calling this new economy the cuckoo economy? Because certain of the companies that show up and that are worldwide operating take great advantage, for example, if I take the Swiss system, of a system where you, know, you have extremely good infrastructure, you don't have potholes on the streets, you have security, you have telecom, etc. And then some operator shows up without paying any taxes, without any regulations, uh, without insuring the workers, etc., and makes a very good deal out of it. Uh, as you know, some of these operators take a cut of 30% for providing a service, which is a very good service, uh, but the cut of 30%, I think, is the cuckoo economy. Uh, this is, of course, an issue that each country has to decide. I usually say that you cannot stop innovation by regulation. You can only stop, you can only do better innovations. And so I think the challenge for Europe and Switzerland in particular is to be ahead of the curve in terms of innovation in the digital economy. All right. Last but not least, um, we work for societies. This is a public university. I, I'm very committed to this. And uh, issues of our jobs disappearing, our robots taking over, you know, makes the cover of every uh, magazine you can think of. My favorite one is, of course, The New Yorker. I don't know if you saw this one. This is, you know, the world in 2030, I guess. And, uh, you know, here are the humans and the robots are taking care of it. I think uh, we, we probably don't want to live in this world, but it's one we have to think about. And uh, it's collectively as a society that we have to decide what are the correct regulations so that we are in charge of this new world. I want to finish by quoting uh, Charles Babbage. Babbage, of course, famous for having designed the first computer, the analytical engine in the 19th century. And uh, he created with a bunch of famous people at the time in London, a society called the Analytical Society. And the goal of the Analytical Society was the members were resolved to do their best to leave the world a wiser place than they found it. Uh, the question is, you know, will AI make the world a wiser place? I think we have to make care, we have to take care that this will be our future. Thank you very much for your attention.